Book 3. Dionysius could no longer suffer his failure to win Kyler Ho's love. He had determined to starve to death and was writing his last will and testament with instructions for his burial. In it, he begged Kyler Ho to come to him at last in death. Plan John wanted to go in to her master, but was prevented from doing so by his attendant, who had orders to let no one in. Dionysius heard them squabbling at the door and asked who was coming, causing the trouble. The attendant said it was Plan John. It is the wrong moment for her to come, he said. By now, he did not even want to see anything that would remind him of his passing. Still, Tell her to come in. Planjun opened the door. Why are you wearing yourself out with grief, sir? She said, as though your cause were lost. Kalarho invites you to marry her. Put on fine clothes, offer sacrifice, welcome the bride you love. At this unexpected news, Dionysius was thunderstruck. Mist covered his eyes. He went limp all over and presented a death-like figure. Planjon began to wail. This brought everyone running to the spot, and the master was mourned as dead throughout the whole house. Even Kalerho could not hold back her tears when she heard this. So great was the grief that even she wept for Dionysius as for her husband. At last, and with difficulty, Dionysius regained consciousness. In a weak voice, he said, What spirit is deceiving me and trying to turn me back from the path that lies before me? Was I waking or dreaming when I heard those words? Is Kalerho willing to marry me? Kalerho, who is unwilling even to show herself? Planjon, standing beside him, said, Stop causing yourself unnecessary pain and disbelieving your own good fortune. I am not deceiving my master. Kalerho sent me to talk to you about marriage. Talk about it then, said Dionysius. And tell me her actual words. Do not omit it or add anything. Report exactly what she said. She said, I belong to the first family in Sicily. I have suffered misfortune, but I still have my pride. I have been deprived of my country and my parents. The only thing I have not lost is my nobility. So if Dionysius wants to have me as his concubine, he if he wants to enjoy the satisfaction of his own desires, I will hang myself rather than give my body up to outrage fit for a slave. But if he wants me as his legal wife, then I too want to be a mother, so that Hermocrates' line will be continued. Dionysius should reflect on this, not by himself and in haste, but together with his friends and family, so that no one will say to him afterward, are you going to bring up children born of that bought slave woman? Are you going to bring shame on your house? If he does not want to be a father, he shall not be my husband either. These words inflamed Dionysius all the more, and he conceived some faint hope that suggested to him his love was returned. He raised his arms to heaven and said, Zeus and Helios, only let me see a child born to Kyler Ho. Then I shall think myself happier than the great king. Let us go to her. Take me, my loyal Planjan. He ran upstairs. His first impulse was to fall at Kalerho's feet. But he restrained himself and sat down in a dignified manner. My lady, he said, I have come to thank you for saving me. I would not have forced myself on you, and I had made up my mind to die if you refused me. Thanks to you... I have been restored to life, but although I am deeply grateful to you, I do have a reproach to make. You did not believe that I would take you as my lawful wife for the procreation of children, according to Greek law. If I did not love you, I should not have begged you to marry me on those terms. You seem to think I am out of my mind to imagine that a woman of noble birth is a slave, that a descendant of Hermocrates would not be fit to be my son. Reflect, you say. I have reflected. Are you afraid of my friends, you who are the dearest friend of all? Who will dare to call a son of mine unworthy with a grandfather greater than his father? As he spoke, he approached her with tears in his eyes. 
Calarho blushed and kissed him gently. I trust you, Dionysius, she said. It is my own fortune I do not trust. It has brought me low before now, from greater fortune. I am afraid it has not yet settled its quarrel with me. So, although you are good and just man, invoke the gods as witnesses, not because of yourself, but because of your fellow citizens and family, so that people will know you have taken your oath and so prevented from mounting some yet more malicious plot against me. A woman, all alone and a foreigner, is easy prey for contemptuous treatment. What sort of oaths do you want me to swear before the gods? He said, I am prepared to climb up to heaven if it can be done and lay my hand on Zeus himself. Swear, she said, by the sea that brought me to you, and by Aphrodite, who showed me to you, and by Eros, who is making me your bride. He agreed, and it was done at once. Dionysus's passion raged fiercely and would not suffer the wedding to be delayed. Self-control is painful when desire can be satisfied. He was a civilized man. He had been overwhelmed by a storm. His heart was submerged but still he forced himself to hold his head above the towering waves of his passion. And so, at that time, he entered on the following line of reasoning. Am I to marry her in a deserted spot, as though she were really bought a bought slave? I am not so ungracious as to fail to celebrate my marriage to Calerho. But this is the first thing in which I must show respect for my wife. Besides, it provides security for the future. Rumor is the swiftest thing there is. Rumor travels through the air, and nothing bars its path. It uncovers any hidden surprise. Even now, rumor is rushing to carry to Sicily the strange news that Calarho is alive. Tomb robbers opened her tomb and carried her off, and she has been sold in Miletus. Syracusan warships will soon be descending on us, with Hermocrates in command, demanding his daughter's restoration. What am I to say? Theron has sold her to me? Theron, where is he? Even if they believe me, am I to tell them the truth that I received stolen goods from a pirate? Practice your defense, Dionysius. You may have to plead it before the great king. If you do, it would be best to say, I heard somehow that a freeborn woman was living here. She was willing to marry, and I married her in town, publicly, according to the laws. That is the best way to convince people, even my wife's father, that I am not unworthy of my marriage. Endure a brief delay, my heart, to enjoy a secure pleasure for a longer time. In the trial, my case will be stronger if I have a husband's position, not a master's. That is what he decided to do. He called Leonis and said, Go off to town and prepare things for the wedding in style. Have herds of cattle driven in, and grain and wine brought by land and sea. I have decided to give a public feast for the town. He gave careful instructions, and the next day he himself left, traveling in a carriage. As for Calerho, he did not want her to appear in public yet and he had her taken by boat in the evening right to his house, which was by the harbor called Dosimus. He put her in the care of Plangen. When she was on the point of leaving the estate, Calerho first offered a prayer to Aphrodite. She went into her temple, got everyone to leave, and said to her, Lady Aphrodite, ought I to reproach you or to be grateful to you? You joined me to Charius when I was a maiden. Now you are marrying me to another man after him. I should never have agreed to swear by you and your son if this child, she pointed to her womb, had not betrayed me. For his sake, she said, not for mine, I implore you to keep my deceit a secret. Since my child does not have his real father, let him pass as Dionysius' son. When he has grown up, he will find his real father as well. As they saw her going from the temple precinct to the sea, the boatmen were awestruck, as though Aphrodite herself were coming to embark. And as one man, they made 
worship her, to worship her. The rowers rowed with such enthusiasm that the ship reached harbor more quickly than words can tell. At daybreak, the whole town was already decorated with garlands of flowers. Every man offered sacrifice in front of his own house, and not just in the temples. People were talking about who the bride was, because she was so beautiful and unknown. The common crowd were convinced that a Nirid had come up out of the sea, or that a goddess had appeared from Dionysius' estate. Those were the rumors spread by the sailors. All had but one desire, to see Calerho, and the crowd gathered round the Temple of Concord, where, by tradition, bridegrooms received their brides. Now, for the first time since she had been in her tomb, Calerho dressed up to look her best, for once she had decided to marry, she considered that her beauty continued, constituted her country and lineage. She put on a Milesian dress and bridal wreath and faced the crowd. They all cried, the bride is Aphrodite. They spread purple cloth and scattered roses and violets in her path. They sprinkled her with perfume as she passed. Not a child or an old man remained in their houses or even at the harbors. The crowd packed tight and people even climbed on the roofs of houses. But once more, even on that day, the evil spirit vented his spite. How he did so, I shall tell you shortly. First, I want to relate what happened in Syracuse during the same time.